All right, um, I got. I can't use this ID when I hope I plan something for that, so I'm just trying to show what I hope to show. It's a forecast material, so you want me to start with the current weather, and you can do. Yeah. All right. You do the snowstorm. I'll do the cold. Okay. All right. That way, uh, heat miser, cold miser. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're not exactly a snow miser. No. Basically. Okay. Welcome to our uh, weather discussion. For those of you who uh, have not been here before, we do this every Friday at the same time in the same room uh, during the academic year, so both the spring and the fall semester. We don't do it in the summertime, and we don't do it over spring break. But there's always emergencies that uh, might change any of those plans, but probably not. We have got a lot to talk about today, and um, I don't know if uh, some of it's unfortunately going to be compromised by a lack of uh, technological uh, compliance with what I planned, but I think we'll still be able to make some of the points. He makes these really beautiful uh, animations for us on our webpage. Sometimes they're a whole week long. I'm glad today's just a short one because there's so much to talk about. But you can see elements of some of that discussion already uh, lurking in this picture. So here we have a really beautiful cyclone uh, off the coast of North America. It's now in the central Labrador Sea in the center, and then you, you get another one further to the east. It's been a very active cyclone uh, winter in the North Atlantic. And here's yet another one with a trailing cold front that goes all the way down to the Yucatan and a couple of spots where it's particularly active, at least in cloud development. You can't say for sure if it's precipitating, but it sure looks like it is. And then uh, I'll go to the West Coast next and note that we have um, some very high clouds streaming across the northern uh, provinces of Canada on the western coast of the United States and Canada. And you can see those cloud elements heading straight southward at longitudes about 110, 120 degrees west. <clears throat> and in between is a deep, massive trough. And this green, which in the infrared might otherwise lead you to believe it's just cold cloud tops, is simply cold air. So this is, and you can see it road over Ontario and Manitoba uh, fairly quickly during the day, but it's frigid up in um, the Northwest Territories and uh, the archipelago. Right about here is where a current uh, feature of interest resides, and it's gonna make its way down over us and bring us, I think, conditions that could well give us a run at the all-time minimum temperature here in Madison. I want to tell you a couple things about that record as it stands. It was set January 30th, 1951. It was minus 37 at the airport of Truax Field. It was minus 26 at North Hall here on campus. So that was a very local anomaly to get down to minus 37. The only other time the temperature in Madison has been minus 30 was January 15th, 1963, also at Truax. And there were other observations in the area that were close, but not quite as cold as that, but not as differing as 11 degrees. So minus 30 seems to be almost the physical limit for how cold it can get. That's what that leads me to believe. On both of those days, and then days that had gotten to minus 29, there were two such days, March 2nd, amazingly, 1963, and then uh, February 3rd, 1996. So that's the one that's closest. That was in a streak of 108 hours of uh, below zero temperatures. Uh, in that February, second to, the, uh, second to the sixth. And um, so on all of those days, the 1,500 thicknesses never dropped below 500 decameters. The 850 temperature was never lower than minus 28. Both of those conditions will easily be met here on Wednesday morning. We'll have a thickness of about 578 or something ridiculous <coughs> like that. About 478, I've never seen it so low. And the 850 temperature will be near minus 40, just to our southwest if not below minus 40. I've never seen that in our near vicinity. So it seems to me, and we'll have, Michael will tell us a little bit about the coming snow on Monday, we will have, even if we don't even need it, we already have a radiative blanket now, but we're gonna have another six, maybe eight inches, maybe 10 inches of new fluffy snow on top of what we already have immediately before the invasion of the exceptionally cold air. The only thing that's working against us, and it was um, a very obvious characteristic of the January 1951 event was, it wasn't giant, we weren't in the middle of a giant anticyclone, but we were uh, in a region of very low sea level pressure gradient, so light winds. Not true on March 2nd, 63. So you can get to minus 30 with, you know, light winds. We may have greater than light winds on Wednesday morning. So that might be the only factor that gets in the way. Other than that, the thermodynamic table is set for a run at minus 30 or lower on Wednesday morning. And so with the winds, if it's minus 26, somewhat disappointing, but with the winds uh, in a 15 knot range, that'll be 
wind chills in the minus 65 ish range. Uh, <coughs> no one should be going outside. Almost to the point where the petroleum in your gas tank will turn to jelly. And not quite. But it's going to be remarkable. And um, I know there's a little drama here, but let's face it, this is history. We're, we, we're going to make a run at this. So we have to talk about it this way. But we're going to talk about uh, some of the features that we'll be able to identify now on hemispheric maps, and we'll look at them in the forecast. So I think uh, I'll give an overview of the current weather now, and then Michael's going to talk about the uh, snow event that we're looking at. I do like that event. And, uh, okay. and then after that, I'll come back and talk about the cold. And I had some Viz 5D stuff that I wanted to show. I think I can still make the same points, perhaps not in exactly the same way, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. So, yeah, yeah. Just real quick, there's a comment on the YouTube stream, which we've got 27 people watching the world today. That's kind of record. Yeah. Anyways, I wanted to know, can we say something about this polar vortex and the recent sudden stratospheric warming event? Anybody want to take that on? Because uh, there was a sudden stratospheric warning of, of warming about two weeks ago. Yeah, it was that actually more than that. It was like late, mm -hmm. Yeah, late December. So it was a little bit later ago than that. And then I think one of the immediate seen or maybe even coincident events was the heavy snow in Austria and Germany that uh, was right around Christmas time, maybe right after Christmas. That was unusual uh, for them. They had some cold as well as snow. And uh, one of the things I think that I remember people saying about the, the, the warming event was that it's never easy to say where is the uh, real dump of cold air going to be in the hemisphere. And for a while, it looked like it wasn't going to be us. But I think, uh, I don't know if this is the first or second such event of that and the aftermath of that of that warming i just don't know and i'm not prepared to say anything more about it than that so i think we have to say no unfortunately although it's of great interest great i was saying there's there's something globally going on here and on the left side of that screen you see that breaking breaking uh, wave there mm -hmm. that's going on um, right here yeah uh, you want me to go to go 17. Yeah, well, it would be interesting to look at that. There's, there's something going on, and it's hooked up with the southern hemisphere. I don't know what it is, but it's interesting. It's the same thing over the Pacific and goes 17. Mm -hmm. You see how that goes way to the south down there? Yeah, that's low, low latitude northern hemisphere. Uh, it's hard to see. And when I'm when I'm looking at the, the jet streams, I see a connection of the southern hemisphere subtropical jet, and there's Basically, what this is doing is, is what we were talking about a couple weeks ago on the map site. This is kicking off a super Kelvin wave that's that's about to go across South America at the equator. So it's moving at the equator just to the south of this event. Uh, it's hard to say if, they, if there's any relationship, but it is pretty unusual. Yeah, there's a gap on here. This this starts on the 24th. Only the last several images are live. Yeah, but I'm looking at. The next week where it really connects in to the, to the east and this is the beginning of it right here i don't know what you know there's some connection here there's this global thing and it may be related to that sudden stratospheric warming and how that set things off between you know in the global circular yeah yeah i don't know i don't know enough about that to say so there's certainly a lot going on uh, but i'm going to focus on what's going on over continental north america when i come back to the cold air uh, that does not mean to imply there aren't other connections, but I think you can make some direct statements about stuff here that have plenty of other ancillary science questions that are interesting without regard for any of the other uh, set of questions that are interesting as well. So let's um, let's take a look at our um, 500 millibond map. Because there's nothing on the radar, I'll say that. I, it's just a little bit of lake effect snow in New York State. It's too much to talk about. I'm going to let it go. I've seen it already. There's nothing really there. But this is remarkable. Look at that deep trough over all of really the entire continent of North America. So um, you're seeing numbers in a variety of different measures here that one just doesn't often see. Uh, minus 48 degrees in your in central Ontario, minus 44 at International Falls. That's maybe not dime a dozen, uh, but it's you know something like a dollar a dozen or something like that. And then you this is the hot of, of one piece of the cold air, minus 48. There's another one way up here that's in the minus 45-ish range, too, on the northern edge of the archipelago. That's the disturbance that gets us Wednesday. This one, you'll see, is going to curl around and move to our north and east. Uh, it's going to be a substantial cold for southeastern Ontario and Quebec, but not so much for us. Although that's going to be tied in somehow with the conditions that lead to our major snow. But this is just a re remarkable northerly flow all the way from 
you know, the north slope or north of that in Alaska, straight southward into Nebraska, Kansas, before it finally turns the, the uh, corner. And I don't know who it was who said this. I've heard this uh, before, but somebody said there's nothing to me. It was Lyle Horn, and I never heard him say it. But there's nothing between the uh, North Pole and the central United States except some prairie grass and some barbed wire. And, and this is really the, the manifestation of that sad admonition, if you don't like winter. This is unbelievable. So the major pieces of the puzzle are you must have a ridginess in the western part of the, of, um, the continent. You must have a troughiness over and south of Alaska to help build the ridge over the continent. And then you can get this tremendous northward flow. There isn't, it's not particularly baroclinic in the sense that there's not a gigantic temperature contrast across it, except by virtue of the fact that it's so superbly cold in the center of it. But it's no really strong upper frontal region of one kind or the other. But there's a bunch of little disturbances that one can see. Uh, here's a little short wave over uh, just north of, um, of uh, Manitoba. And then here's one of the archipelago. We'll keep our eyes on those as they move south. In, uh, this broad upper trough. Tallahassee, we call that the open gate. They yeah, they come right in. The open gate. So <laughs> everybody's susceptible to, there's not going to be a shutdown of cold air. That's for sure. That, that is not going to happen. Uh, it's just unbelievable. It reminds me almost to the day of the large scale situation on the day that the Challenger exploded in 1986. Very, very similar, extraordinary high amplitude drop over the whole continent. And uh, the day before, and then the next day, the cold air made it all the way down to Central Park. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, 300 millibar map, if we could. And one gets the idea that there's a, a whole bunch of local wind speed maxima. It's hard to make, this is one of those maps, it's not so easy to make sense out of it. Because you've got a little bit of a wind speed max in the 100 knot range over uh, eastern Montana, Wyoming. You've got a second feature that has uh, a northerly component to it that's in the 100 plus knot range. And then you've got this feature of 170 knots on the downstream side of the trough axis that we saw south of Alaska. And then this is in the 160, 150 knot range along the east coast. Um, and it's partly polar, it's probably partly subtropical. And then we've got another big curve in the flow with high wind speeds downstream. So it's a very wavy jet stream. And it's um, uh, that is sometimes characteristic of these kinds of cold air outbreaks uh, that you can see. One of the things I hope to show when I get to the cold air itself is that, you know, Steve Cavallo and Greg Hakem have this idea of that there are coherent vortices on the tropopause at high latitude. And they're called tropopause polar vortices. And they're formed as a function, partly as a function of cooling of Arctic stratospines. And the cooling from above increases the PV below the cooling and uh, or the cooling above enhances the PV, and you start to develop these, you could almost call them warts on the Arctic tropopause, these regions of large PV. And underneath them, by virtue of the structure that any positive PV anomaly has to have, there has to be a pool of exceptionally cold air beneath it. And so I think what I wanted to show with this 5D is the movement of these various vortices, they're not so easy to see in these depictions, we'll be able to see them in Michael's PV maps. The movement of those vortices is coincident exactly with the movement of the cold air. And so one likes to see whether or not, I'd like to know whether or not there's been an increase in the size of these tropopause polar vortices over time, and whether or not, um, as a consequence, they have larger puddles of cold air beneath them. And so that we become more susceptible to their invasion because they're just larger than they used to be. I don't know if that's true, I'm speculating. So one thing that supports the speculation is the uh, measurements that people have made, like Tristan Lecuyer has made, where there's an increased water vapor flux to high latitude during the time. So there's more basic ingredient for the production of the clouds that lead to the production of the TPVs. So if all of that stuff's working in a certain direction, it may lead us to a situation in which we're more susceptible to the kind of cold that we may experience in the middle of the week. So that's the broad thing that I hope to show you with this IB. And hopefully I can show you some other things that will relate to that. So let's go down to the lower troposphere and see what things look like at uh, 850 millibars feet. So here's 850. And look at the incredible horizontal temperature contrast across Western Canada. Again, minus 34 at 850 in central Ontario, that's where it was minus 48 at 500 millibars. And so that's desperately cold. That doesn't usually get that cold. And then there's a close, this is minus 31 at Churchill. And then there's uh, a suggestion of something colder than minus 36. In fact, the analysis suggests minus 38 at that point on the western shore of Hudson Bay. That's cold. 
That's trope moss bowl of vortex number one. Number two is way up here where the temperature is uh, in the minus 20, uh, minus 30 ish range uh, right now. And we've got a little bit of a thermal ridge to our southwest over South Dakota and Nebraska, and that's coincident with this uh, troughiness in the same location. So downstream of that trough axis, there's concentrated and differential warm infection. That's probably going to lead to the uh, little bit of snow we might see today, or at least a high cloud increase during the day. Where does Monday's event come from is not so obvious in this particular depiction, but we'll see that as we um, kind of focus on that a little bit later. It's on the hints of it are in the upper left of that map, right far, further, further out, oh. Pacific. Oh, right here. Further out. Right here. Further out. Right here. Right here. No, north. Oh, <laughs> right here. Under height. <laughs> Why didn't you stop with that? Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> stop <for a> while. <laughs> okay. So a fairly unimpeded pathway, a broad northwesterly flow, a little bit of a hump to get over here, and then right in. So that's the flight path <coughs> for that disturbance. Um, and here's the one that we saw on the satellite. Uh, it's a little bit delayed from what we just saw on the satellite, where the, the cyclonic center was more over central uh, Labrador Sea. But this is from 7 a.m. this morning, and the satellite was more approximate in time. But you can see a pretty nice structure here especially on the uh, leading edge of the warm invention. It's very concentrated. That accounts for the cloud head portion of the storm, and then the Earth's cold front uh, has been modified, and this kind of lower troposphere is structured over the Gulf Stream. But you can see it's pretty intense. It involves quite a number of the uh, isotherms in very cold air. And, uh, so it's a desperately cold North American continent right now, and the cold air is not going to be well behaved, and, and that is it's not going to stay in place. It's going to make some moves, some migrations towards us. And we'll see that in um, I think that's about it for the current weather. I don't want to take too much more time. I don't know what else. Uh, surface map. We want to do that for sure. So here's our surface map. Now, we're still at minus two in the last hour. Uh, it's zero at Green Bay. We started out. I don't know what it was at the airport. I had minus nine at my house. Was it colder? It must have been minus 15 or something. Yeah, I had minus 12. I had oh, you had minus 12? What? The airport had either 12 or 16. Yeah, 12 or 16. I thought, let's, so it's around minus it 12. <clears throat> From weather? Yeah, let's see what the airport's overnight low was. Let's see what the low was. So minus nine is all I got through. Let's go, let's go further. We'll we'll go the uh, minus ten was in the last six hours. <clears throat> okay, so minus ten. Uh, that's that's surprising. I was just about as cold. Yeah, okay, um, and that's with light winds. That's not usually the case around here. That's usually about a five or six degree difference minimum. So, but minus two now. One of the things I think we should be thinking about for next week is how many consecutive hours will we be below zero at, at the airport? I think it's the, the temperature will go below zero sometime Monday afternoon. And then if I don't think it'll come back till sometime middle of the day or late in the day next Friday. So it's going to be at least 72 hours, probably more like close to 95 or something. Um, I mean, we could put donuts on this uh, and, and have some fun. We could also have a forecast contest for a minimum temperature during the whole street. How low do we actually get? Um, and then, of course, there's always a snowfall. So there's at least three things. One could win the Triple Crown. The we'll simple answer is... One for the length of time that we're below zero in one the unit. time units, yeah. and then minus one for the lowest temperature normalized by whatever lowest temperature. See, that's that's the meteorological equivalent of lawyer talk. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a point. Uh, but minus two now, we'll get above zero today. But look at it snowing minus four at uh, the snowing minus one at the field of dream, the plus one. Yeah, you see a nice cyclonic circulation in northwest Iowa. So I guess it's like a clipper type system. Yeah, yeah there's yeah, a hint yeah, of it in the uh, 850 map. Yep, yeah. you can see that shows a pretty nice. Yeah, thing. that's right. Where we saw that ridge, I think, in the mm -hmm. field, right? Yep, yeah, that's right. The other thing is, can we look at the 12Z map? Just be kind of interesting, just to do a quick comparison. I know it's not apples to apples, but if we look at the 12Z uh, surface map and compare the look at some of the lowest temperatures this morning. Yeah, and then maybe go back and look at 850 just to see kind of is there a crude relationship between 42 and 44. Yeah, well, here's the station that was minus 34 and 850, minus 48 at 500. It's colder at the surface, so mm -hmm. it's isothermal. Minus 33, minus 36. Look at the look at that. 33 here. Yeah, that's and the air mass we're dealing with is going to be, we should be dealing with next week, because we'll be showing it's going to be far colder than this. Yeah, that's right. This one. 
this one doesn't, doesn't have the same uh, sense at all. In fact, before I leave, can we go to the 850 map, uh, the forecast panel from 12Z analysis, zero hour analysis? Can we go back just for one second? Oh, yeah. But you have there. It's even on the bridge. <coughs> And this is another curiosity I want to just point oh, out. Yeah. Look at this trough that extends across, um, what was it, like Huron through Lake Superior. Huron Superior, yeah. Right. I think this is a reflection of the fact, just I just had a reflection of the fact that you have this cold air over these warm lakes, and you're getting a pressure minimum and a pressure trough that's forming. It's a little bit downstream from the it's axis. It's an aggregate of the lake. lake effect. Yeah. Right. It's like it's that's got, Sassoonis did a lot of work. Yeah, yeah Peter Sassoonis at Michigan and, yeah. and say did some work on this. Um, and we were talking to John this morning that. In the past, you would see this broad trough, troughiness over the Great Lakes in the winter. But I think now with refined observations, you know, see also in the forecast models that running the models at a much higher grid spacing or finer grid spacing, you can actually begin to pick out the lakes and the troughs that are associated. Yeah. And these will actually, these types of structures, I believe, are going to play a big role in setting up the winds that are going to help lower our wind chill next week. Yeah, um, and raise the temperature. I think that's right. I think that's the thing that's going to conspire. You're so right about this. If you look at the, you'll show us, or maybe I will. We'll see the Wednesday morning forecast. In the eastern half of Lake Superior, there seems to be a mesoscale cyclone. I can't wait to see what it looks like on the satellite, because it looks like it's a very isolated spot where the pressure is lower in an otherwise broad trough. Right now. And, uh, no, in the forecast. And so that's going to be really interesting to see in the satellite when it finally does Manifest itself, and it's a function exactly what you're talking about. The extraordinary never get below minus three. It might be. I know there's a risk. I don't know. I'm not looking at it as a negative part of it in terms of getting us colder, but I think the other aspect is that trough will interact with this TPV or whatever the structure is that's coming out from the mm -hmm. from very high latitudes and help energize the the um, the cyclone. The cyclone itself. Maybe that shows up in the models as well. That would be exciting to see that, and maybe we'd even see some snowflakes temperatures in the minus 20 range, but which has never happened yet. So I'll take anything that's never happened. Uh, any of the variety of possibilities will satisfy me. Snow fog? Yeah. Oh, why not? Yeah, ice yeah, yeah. Ice fog. Right? <laughs> I love that. Ice fog. Yeah. We never get ice fog. That would be great. Good. I think they're getting it today on the north <laughs> coast. Somewhere, so. Okay. Uh, can we go to one last thing and then I'll turn it over to Michael for, for the time being? Let's look at the uh, 12Z GFS run, the zero hour forecast at 8 I just want to point out how these things look in color. It's a little bit easier maybe to see some of these things. So here's here's um <coughs> sweet time, didn't you? Um, here's the minus 34-ish at 850 that we saw. So there's the first cold bubble in central Ontario. Here's the one on Hudson Bay. There's Wednesday. And so we're going to see these things moving southward and taking slightly different directions as they get to some more southern latitude. This one ends up to our south with temperatures in the minus 40 range. So, okay, so I, I think I think that's it for me. And then I'll come back for the cold. We used to talk about the red being bloody cold. What is the green? Uh, Gangrenous. Magically delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's really cold. Now let's get the scale. Let's not be fooled by the colors. That means 42. minus 40 to minus 42. All right, and Pete gave away the it's franchise. But right over the field of dreams. At 3 a.m. on Wednesday morning, the temperature will be minus 42. It's interesting eight. that that's getting substantially colder as it drives south. It's yeah. not getting warm. And that's getting one, of the, that's one of the things I want to show about. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so All right. there you go. Okay, can we go So what, what I first want to start off with not the weekend weather. I think it'll be largely dry, maybe a few flurries here or there. Cold, but not severely cold. But the I think the biggest weather feature that's going to be impacting our area and much of the north north central part of the United States is going to be the cyclone that's forecast by many models to be located over northern Iowa, north central Iowa by uh, Monday morning, 12 days, so this is 6 a.m. You can see it has a, a nice classic structure uh, with a fairly modestly defined warm front with a cold front that you could perhaps make out in this as well. Um, just very nice structure to the cyclone. And you can see the band of um, moderate snowfall, at least, or perhaps even heavy snowfall, that's accumulated just to its east by the time we get to this map time. What I first want to do is just trace the origins of this particular disturbance. The cold air that John's been talking about and so excited about 
reasons that I can't understand other than the historical nature of it. <laughs> They're still lurking up here in the northern part of this map, so it's not even directly associated with that. But it's going to be this cyclone just tracing its origins from a couple different perspectives that will link into some of John's discussion of the, these trough balls of uh, vortices. And um, we'll look at this. You know, John was planning to do a this 5D perspective. I'm going to show a little bit on the dynamical trough balls yeah. from the same series of maps. It's really interesting. And we'll also look at the vertical structure of those as a little JPEG there that will help us understand that. So we'll get back to this map time, 72 hours from now, with, with moderate snow over us. And I'll just say, to sort of give away a little bit of, the, of what's forecast, as the cyclone goes by, at least within the GFS, depending on the snowfall ratios that it ends up being, what these ratios end up being, we look at anywhere from 9 to about 15 inches of snow forecast by the GFS. Other model forecasts are considerably lower. Some of them actually have the cyclone all over, just about done, by 15Z, and already to our west, to our east. So there's still some uncertainty in this. But let's go back to where the cyclone is. So the first thing I want to do is uh, scroll back up to the top of this page and let's get a much broader view of the continental scale. Let's go up here. There's a cyclone, and let's first go to, to what they call a very dynamics for 500 millibar heights and vorticity. And what you'll see by the time we arrive at 12Z on Monday, we have a nice, well developed uh, short wavelength trough. You can see it in the height field. You can also see a very nice, Clearly defined vorticity maxima. That's not surprising with this. That's just upstream of our surface cyclone that's located right here in north uh, northern Iowa. So really a nice configuration. Not the most optimal configuration because the trough is almost right on top of the upper of the surface cyclone. It's just a little bit to the east. Or the upper trough is just a little bit to the west of the uh, surface cyclone position. But you know, there's certainly clearly with this change in curvature, a really nice area of divergence <laughs> moving over us. You know, sufficient moisture you can expect to see some significant snowfall. If we go step back in time, let's just trace this, and you'll see that the origins of this disturbance are way out over the Pacific um, this morning. You can see it gets a little bit kind of uh, blurred out here, but this is the structure that we're looking at. You can see the kind of nice ball developed trough that shows up in the vorticity field. Here it is. Here we're 54 hours back. It's becoming less impressive as so we go backward as it enters, uh, going backward uh, into um, British Columbia. It emerges from this structure. It's a little bit messy as we go through. Here it is. Stop for just a moment because we're going to go forward in a few seconds. But notice this ridge that forms up just south of the Aleutian Island chain and just south of Alaska. This is a really curious feature. I think it's tied to, John can see, see the strong area of warm invection that was on the, uh, the 850 millibars in the analysis. This, is, this ridge building is pretty dramatic, and I think it helps to set set the stage for this, this subsequent uh, series of features. But we can keep going further back before this begins to fracture off. So this trough right here still looks pretty good. We'll go back a bit further. Now 24 hours into the forecast. <coughs> now it gets a little bit, is it this piece or is it this piece? But focus on this main uh, trough axis here. And then finally get to our current time. And we can go back to the beginning if you just want to do that broad area of just sort of influent vorticity that's just south of the Aleutian Islands. And so we'll step forward and again just to, to trace the evolution of this, but <laughs> we can trace the upper feature that's associated with this developing this um, forecasted cyclone to a feature well over the Pacific. Hmm. And uh, some of the things you often hear is, well, it's over the Pacific, not a well-observed area. In the satellite area, thanks to the work done in this building <laughs> historically, we have observations out over the Pacific that can help uh, constrain our analyses. They're not you know, certainly perfect, and there are certain situations where these observations, the most sensitive regions for given forecast can be under cloudy areas, and that's a, that remains a very challenging task for uh, data simulation folks and modelers to deal with how to get that data into the models and assimilate it well. But just because it's over the Pacific doesn't mean it's this is uh, necessarily going to end up causing significant uncertainty in the forecast. But we can still, you know, I think it's, more, it's really interesting just identifying where these features are. Let's go back forward in time to make sure we haven't missed anything in the future. But notice this wave breaking that occurs as this trough begins to fracture. Watch the ridging developing here. It's really interesting. I think it comes out of this cyclone that's upstream of a strong warm advection pattern in the lower trough history, helping to build the heights just north of this. See the, this beginning to fracture. And we'll stop here for a second. This is that vortex that John will be looking at a little bit later on. That's going to be the, uh, the source of our extremely horrifically cold air. 
This makes landfall, if you will, this upper trough of the British Columbia coast by uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. We're halfway to the climate that's about to be impacting us. And then we can again follow this board and time to go a little bit faster. Really quick through this. And you see how this begins to change its structure and the trough becomes a bit more impressive. We approach uh, Wednesday, Monday evening. And then we'll go one more quick beyond that time, 72 hours. So we see the trough axis is finally just um, just to our west by this time. And if I were looking at this forecast, I would imagine we still have another six hours or more of at least some light snow as the trough axis has to pass by us. So we can clearly trace this from this perspective. But a really neat thing is uh, that's been added to this, this page over the last, I just noticed it today, frankly, is we can also view the evolution of this from the dynamic tropopause. So what this is, is a map that shows the potential temperature along a surface of constant potential vorticity. And these colors here are in the pressure, are the <coughs> data along the dynamic tropopause. So low values here indicate a very low, the scale right here, 270 Kelvin or so. That's, you know, typically I think that's pretty close to the surface, but we know our surface temperature can be much colder than that. And then you can also see these really warm colors where you have potential temperature values that are approaching about 400 K or even warmer. And so you can really see the structure of the dynamical tropopause. You can see where upper fronts exist on these maps in this contoured region where the ice and tropes along the dynamical tropopause get closer together. That would be perhaps characteristic of an upper front. Um, so this gives you a broad sense of some of the key dynamical features of the upper troposphere that we'll be watching or perhaps psychogenesis events or, or keeping track of these vortices that John has been referring to. What about those ripples over in the Pacific? Over here? So these could be from regions of convection, perhaps, and then the, the, the warmth from those convective cells being spread northward. This is you know, actually the winds here out of the west, so that's probably not exactly the case. Mm -hmm. But these ripples, some they, kind of gravity waves or something? The gravity waves are how this analysis was constructed, how they, they actually identify this analysis. So just to say a little bit about these, these types of structures, and it links into something John said really nicely, and I think it will come back, you know, perhaps we can come back to this figure. I took a figure here from a Hoskins paper, right here down here, please, this JPEG, that just shows certain characteristic structures of, um, for the building blocks for cyclones in this case. So what this is, is a cross-section through a vortex, a vortex that's centered up in the upper troposphere. And the way this was constructed, for those of you that have had 452 or even 310 and 311, um, assuming gradient wind balance, and then assuming that this heavy dark line right here, which denotes the tropopause, separating the tropospheric air from the stratospheric air, assuming that the tropopause has a particular temperature structure, and then it's basically isothermal at the surface, and then trying to figure out what balance structure, satisfying gradient wind balance and, and uh, thermal wind balance, should exist. And it's one in which you have this huge dip in the tropopause associated with a positive potential vorticity anomaly located where this plus is. Beneath it, it's colder than normal. Above it, these isotropes bow downward, so it's warmer than normal. And you can see the, the effective jets or the strong cyclonic circulation that exists around this vortex. So this is a, a vortex that's at the tropopause. It's associated with a depressed tropopause, such that the potential temperature along that tropopause is lower than the surrounding areas, which is precisely the types of structures we're looking at on the maps when we go back to the tropopause map. If you want to build a cyclone, another way to build that is, and so the cyclonic circulation also associated with this can extend all the way to the ground. It may be weak, but you can have some weak surface. You can also create a cyclonic circulation at the ground by just simply having it warm at the ground and not having much of anything, any undulation at the tropopause. So this is a disturbance that's based on purely having it locally warm at the surface. And thermal wind balance dictates that you have to have a cyclonic structure that decays with height. And the combination of these two can lead to some really dramatic psychogenesis events. Uh, we're not going to see, I don't think this, the event we're about to see coming up is not going to be particularly dramatic, but it will be associated with some of So this dip in the tropopause is often going to be associated with colder temperatures beneath it, as uh, Professor Martin mentioned earlier, and in the lower stratosphere is going to be warmer. And you have a strong cyclonic circulation about it. So let's go back to the, to the weather page. And here's one of these structures. Again, this is sort of mapping out the structure of that tropopause. It's colder here, lower values of potential temperature along the dynamical tropopause. So this is going to be associated with a nice, clear cyclonic circulation. 
here's Wednesday's event <clears throat> that's lurking upstream that you can see the winds are going to be affecting this uh, south. So let's go back to the beginning and look at the first go to six hours and just follow the, follow the um, stroke pause features in time. Hey, Michael. Yep. We have a request from Scott online to maybe compare that with what one of the composites that we've been doing recently, which is air mass RGB. Okay. This is this is what it looks like, and I'm not going to get into all of the interpretation other right. than purple is the limb, but the, the browner areas tend to be areas of lower tropopause and higher potential force. So you can compare this image perhaps with this one. Okay. Neat. You can see there's a gradient here, and as I haven't looked at these those images enough yeah. to, uh, to make sensible statements about the uh, comparisons. But if you can go back one more quick to that, just to reorient ourselves. Okay, so across uh, Texas into central Louisiana, let's go back to that other. <laughs> Seems like it's roughly mapping out this area right out of here. But part of this is a function of how they've created, uh, how NSEP creates these maps. I don't know if they're actually taking the 2 PBU or doing some different completion. Be interested to do some comparison. Yeah, we could, that way you can get an idea of where the tropical pause is versus what you're seeing on the satellite. Right. So let's mm -hmm. step forward and watch the evolution. And we need to step forward. Quickly. So here's the structure 12, Z, uh, 12 hours in the forecast. We can go ahead. We know what 36 hours was making landfall. Uh, so, so here it is. Right here, you can see it's beginning to fracture. Again, another depiction of the same situation we saw in the whole bars. There's a nice trough right there. Let's go to 48 hours just to move this along. It's now in this northwesterly flow. We're uh, about to head to the southwest or southeast, and then we'll go to 72 hours. And we'll be getting us back to the beginning of this really nice, well developed cyclonic circulation. So that's the upper piece of this. Mm -hmm. That's the trouble pulse depression. Let's also look, and we can zoom in now at this. Well, before we do that, let's go to 850 millibars temperature. We'll start at 36 hours on that. Uh, temperature and height, yeah, that would be great. 36, or 36 hours. For 36 hours, that's when that, that trough was just making landfall. You can see a trough at 850 millimars also shows up uh, pretty clearly just inland over parts of northern British Columbia. Let's go to 48 hours for that. Notice with that westerly flow at upper levels down the slopes of the uh, Rocky Mountains, on the east slopes of it, we've created this little thermal ridge right here. We have the upper trough that's still lurking just towards northwest. We'll go to uh, 60 hours. It has sort of a clipper-like structure to it initially. You can see a nice thermal ridge that's now kind of intersecting the um, where we have a geopotential minimum. And so we'd expect that this cyclone would be tracking to the southeast along the thermal gradient, sort of in the direction of the thermal wind. Let's go to 72 hours. Get us reoriented. So there's our cyclone <coughs> now interacting with the upper trough. The cyclonic circulation at 850 is a little bit displaced from where the thermal ridge is, which is to be expected as you get this sort of interaction. So really nice, well developed cyclone. So let's zoom in now back to um, Helen and just we'll go to the surface precipitation, we'll go to precipitation rate, and let's go to just 48 hours and look at the evolution. This when are things going to get started here? So this is Sunday morning, 12Z, so 6 a.m. Looks like we're going to have a nice crisp morning with a relatively weak geostrophic winds over us. Should be pretty cold, so we're going to be perhaps below zero at this time. We can check out those temperatures. Um, we'll do it just directly. Let's go to 60 hours in the forecast. Let's see again that cyclone along the northwest tracking southeastward. Uh, the snow still is just, you know, beginning to arrive. Some uh, mixed precipitation, perhaps up into northern Illinois, but we're solidly increasing this forecast in the snow. We go to 84 hours, just 12 hours later. Snow is still going on, even at this point. This is the cumulative snowfall, just about over. And then one more click to 96 hours. I'm going to go this over to John in just a second. So, one of the things that I'll just point out uh, if we go back to 84 hours, for just a moment. Through this a little bit. There's 
a strong upper trough that John's going to focus on in just a moment. Um, we have the snow behind this. It's going to get really windy, so there'll be a lot of blowing and drifting snow once this is over. We'll have accumulated amounts. Watch what happens out along, just along Lake Superior um, in this region out here. This is, again, the cold lakes or warm lakes with cold air over them and just go to 90 hours. Yeah. The formation of this sort of inverted or this trough like feature right up just in the lee of the lakes <coughs> flow and this upper trough. So you have the cyclonic circulation impinging upon another cyclonic circulation at low levels. And I think with the lower pressures here, higher pressures with the ridge that's coming in, that's going to help accentuate the northerly wind overs. Last thing I want to talk about with this, and this has been tracking the, feet, the initial features and looking at how they come together, is this look at the accumulated amounts in the winter. Um, weather and we'll look from let's also zoom in sorry continental regional midwest and let's go to the amounts down at the bottom look at the 10 to 1 this is the total liquid accumulation uh, it's about 0.8 which is pretty decent oh, I love that. So we'll go to the snow at the bottom uh, so 10 to 1 ratio so the nice classic thing is about 7.6 here in Dane County in Madison at the airport with heavier amounts, just these. This is at 90 hours of the forecast. It's totally ten to one ratio with those temperatures. No, this is if yeah, it works. If it were ten to one, it's not to look at it. Yeah. Right, we'll use oh. this Kuchera technique, which looks mm -hmm. at the maximum temperature of the column from primary to below bars down to the surface. Look at that. We do the conversion about 11.7, uh, with the heaviest axis of the snow to our north. We go back to 84 hours. I know this is not quite where the storms are in terms of the done. Let's just look at one other model simulation. To look at the FD3, which is going to at some point um, from the model of choice, only 6.8 compared to the 11 or so inches. But it puts the axis of heaviest snow to the north. And if you look at the, um, that's the 10 to 1, you know, a little bit more, less than that. If you look at other models, finally, one last one, and this is truly it, MAM, at 84 hours, <coughs> just 5.8. That's when you're using the most favorable snowfall. And the last thing is look at the surface precipitation. So the pressure, just look at the, the structure of that. We were still going pretty long with the snow. Even at this point, there's accumulated snow. So the reflectivity is not quite the same variable. Like the uh, ECMWF has consistently had it over and over and over the axis of heavier snow. There's more in, they've had a heavier rates, but mm -hmm. it's always been over more than more than six or six or so. And Go to 72 hours. That's, sorry, this is, this is an alternative to John. 72 hours from the NAM. The structure of this, I mean, this is really just about over. And I think in the other forecast, it was still going on. But John, you want to say something about the cold air? Yeah, just, just take a second. Right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Pete, if we can go back to the um, US version on Pivotal, I think that'll be good enough to show what I want to show. And I'll do it as quickly as I can. Uh, let's go to 850 temperatures. And then we'll be looking at the PV. I didn't know they had the PV maps. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the nice thing. So really go to, uh, you know, GFS too, right? Uh, yeah. You want to use the 850 temperature, yeah. So and I, need, I guess I need, a, I need it a little bit bigger than this. So, yeah, that, that's a too small. Okay. So, yeah, I want to show this. This is, the, this is now valid on Monday in the morning. So this is our Wednesday cold event. Can we... You toggle back and forth between this and the PB map. So we got to find the PB map. Upper dynamic. Right in and then let's go to, uh, how about pressure in the PB? That'll be an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, this is a little bit easier to see, I think, what I want to show. So we can toggle back and forth between that prior map. You know, let me pull it up in another. Okay, that'll be really helpful. Because then we can advance in time the same way. And the point is just this, that these upper vortices that come out of the Arctic. Since, as Michael showed so nicely with the Hoskins diagrams, they have this, this um, structure where there's cold air beneath them. You can watch them migrate either at the tropopause level or at the surface theta level or near surface theta level, and they and really show the same thing. And so we can get an idea how this might be moving. So let's go to the PV map. There it is. Uh, yeah, we got to get the same. Great. So here's the the uh, lowest or the highest pressure. In fact, what is that, Pete? Can we, can we see the scale? 700 millibars is the tropopause level over this chain of lakes in Canada, uh, just to the west of Churchill, Manitoba. 
So the trope plaza is at three and a half kilometers or something like that over here in the in the middle of this trope plaza PV uh, feature. So it, and it has that kind of broad scale. So then let's see what it looks like at 850 in the same spot. And you can see the temperatures there are like minus 40, I think, right? If you put the cursor over there, it's in the minus 40 range. Oh, so yeah, it's, it's around minus 40. So that like like uh, fresca, I don't know what you call it. And let's go ahead six hours at both of these increments, or both the levels, I mean. Oh, maybe six isn't enough. Oh, it is enough. Okay, so you can see the, the uh, feature moving southward, and then see what it looks like at 850. At the same time, I don't think it is. Oh, it is? Okay, so yes, it, over here in northwestern Manitoba, let's go 12 hours ahead. 96. Thank you. Yeah, go to 90. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, John, that white area in there is too low for it to meet yeah, that's the scale. It's, so that's it's, right. It's not even 700 millibars. It's lower than that, like 725 or something. So we're right over Lake Winnipeg by the time we get to Tuesday, uh, well, Monday night, midnight. And this, this is the scale still of the anomaly. And so we expect the coldest area at 850 to be right about this. Let's see if that's the case. <coughs> Same time. Yep, there it is. And we're, again, in the minus 40 range. So I guess we don't have to keep bouncing back and forth. Let's just watch what the PV does and, and we get to the next uh, answer. So let's go 12 hours ahead again. Look at that. <coughs> Northwestern Minnesota. So here comes the really coldest air. We know that by proxy. Let's go 12 hours more. And by the time we get to midnight on uh, Wednesday, or Tuesday night into Wednesday morning, the coldest air is just to, presumably, just to our west with this tropopause uh, polar vortex sitting right over us, just about centered over us. I mean, it couldn't be better. It's the coldest portion of it is just to our west, but the main thing is centered over us. Just for the fun of it, six hours past this, what does it look like? Yeah, then it's just south of us uh, in the coldest portion. So this is now Wednesday morning. And how about the 850 temperature at this time, Pete, 120 hours? Coldest 850 temperatures are like, uh, you know, Rockford area. So it's minus 40. Oh, doesn't show up. Yeah, it's minus 40 at 850, just to our south. We're in the high minus 30s by this time. I don't, I've never seen an 850 millibar temperature that cold, ever, uh, at this location. And then the last thing we should look at it's exactly in line with what Michael was showing about the eastern part, especially of Lake Superior, is the sea level pressure map. And we can zoom in on that. Knowing that the coldest air is right over us by the time we get to Wednesday morning, what does a wind situation look like in this forecast? Precipitation or click marine effect. Anyone in the US? Uh, let's get the, no, let's get the uh, Midwest close up. Uh, that's maybe too much of a close-up. <coughs> but first, before you leave, 474 thicknesses? It's Are you less kidding than me? <laughs> we're below 474. So the middle of this maybe is 473, 472. So we're like 473 thickness from 1,500 millibars. That's a full 200 meters lower than I've ever seen. So the suggestion is get up on Wednesday morning, go outside, take a deep breath, that's get dressed right. first, and then... <clears throat> Put on the ozone mask. All right, ozone mask. This is one of those things that if you spit, it freezes before it hits the Well, Michael was thinking, maybe he's going to do that boiling water experiment. <laughs> if I come in bandaged so, up, I screw it up. The lowest thicknesses, <laughs> I think these are the lowest thicknesses in the northern hemisphere, mm -hmm. right over us. And um, look at this kind of exaggerated local minimum and sea level pressure now. It's not just a broad trough over Lake Superior. I have a feeling it's going to be really worthwhile looking at the satellite picture on that day. I think you're going to see a mesoscale almost uh, almost up all alone in the eastern half of Lake Superior. And I think that's the signature of that. That'll be really a beautiful signature on, on the map. So, but as a consequence of the pressure being lower here, and we've got 1047 to our west, we have a pretty decent, although, you know, of course, pivotal draws them every two millibars, but uh, that's a pretty strong horizontal pressure gradient. And uh, not unlike March 2nd, 19, uh, January 15th, 1963, where it looked about as intense, and we still got to minus 30. Um, but this is definitely a larger pressure gradient than the all-time low. So I, I think if this if this whole thing pans out the way that it looks, the pressure gradient and the resultant winds would probably be enough to um, to keep us from getting into that deep low 30s or uh, minus 30 range. However, you're going to have some decoupling, I think, of the lowest part of the atmosphere by Wednesday morning with what's going on above. And so the mixing will be somewhat constrained just by that. 
but the that's but that's good. our wind chill forecast for the bus stop <laughs> on Wednesday morning. <laughs> Minus 66 Fahrenheit. And I mean, this is really serious. I mean, this is this may well uh, compel the chancellor to just say we're not going to operate on Wednesday. And I'm sure that public schools will be canceled in the region. 2014, with the last polar vortex, we had classes canceled. For the first half of the day, with like negative two right? wind chill, if your class started before noon, it was canceled. Okay. And that, then it, it was like a careful outside, it's still going to be cold. Yeah. For, for the rest of the day. <laughs> and so, what's this is the two meter temperature forecast at the same time? Look who's coming on board the GFS. <laughs> coming on board the Martin train to the Arctic Hill. <laughs> Minus 35. Minus it will be a 35. Cold day, <laughs> it will, yeah, it will be a cold day. Uh, look at that. That's a two meter forecast. That's as low as we've seen. I don't think we saw lower than minus thirty three. Maybe yes, that was good. Just yeah. to put this out there, Jordan Girth on the SSEC weather list, weather enthusiast list says it won't happen. Keep in mind that the two meter temperatures and winds are derived values. They're not integrated into the model. The GFS has had demonstrable issues with very cold air. So. Not to throw water on that, but, <laughs> <it's true. laughs> no, but, uh, but but I think what John said earlier is really interesting. This is going to be you know the models may be may have had problems and certainly do have problems with their two meter temperatures at times. But you noted that the circumstances in which we're getting this you know, the minute the pre prior records are exceeded in terms of 850 yeah. temperature and some other characteristics. So right. everything's trending in a direction that we'll see what they predicted actually, for this morning. Yeah, we could do that. From a previous run? Routinely, the uh, you mean for this morning's low? Yeah. Routinely, the yesterday. first time it gets cold, the weather service has gone overboard historically, and it never gets as cold as they said. I don't think they did this last time. So that would be some testimony to this. Because I'm preparing my answer to Jordan, which is mostly blah, 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 blah. It's not bad. It's not bad. This is the, the yesterday morning's forecast, 24 hour forecast for this morning. Yeah, so we were minus 10. So and you said, Greg, you have minus 12. 12, minus 12 yeah. So it's going to be in the minus 30 range. Let's say that. I think that's safe to say. That's what it looks like. So, it's so Jordan's right. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to say anything better. Right. I know he's still listening. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but there are circumstances here that are pushing in a direction, like you said, Michael, that would get us closer to that record. And there's, there's, there's no reason to be exceedingly optimistic it'll happen. But there's really no reason to pull back and say it's only going to be minus 20. And that's why I think the weather service is starting to dribble out across, uh, you know, cell phones and stuff like that. It should be lower than what they're saying right now. But with all the statements and sort of jo joking around about going outside and doing all sorts of things, just be safe in this. This is this yeah, is dangerous cold. It is dangerous cold. There's no doubt about that. And, and it's it's really uh, something that you can't take lightly. And uh, I I think if I come to work on Wednesday, I'm just going to have a scarf wrapped around my whole face. And I've never done that before. But <laughs> I'm going to do it on Wednesday. There's just no way I'm going to put myself in that condition without uh, without some protection. But my, the glee that I'll feel will be an inner war. <laughs> <laughs> so the 850 temperatures, let's go beyond the cold a little. Are we sure they'll be beyond the cold a little? <laughs> it's it's going to. Oh, the other thing we wanted, we won't talk about it because we're already. That's no, the end of but um, how many hours will we be below zero? When will the temperature approximately drop below zero for the first time and then not come back above? My guess is like 90 something hours. From Monday afternoon till Friday afternoon, we'll be below zero. Continue. I'll go 84. All right. I'm, then I'm, all I'll say is I'm higher than you. And I'm higher than 84. I don't know exactly how much higher. Uh, I think it'll be more than 84. <laughs> and <laughs> what about lowest temperature? I'm going to say it's going to be minus 32 on Wednesday morning. Up to minus 33. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that'll kill me. <laughs> you get it. That'll really kill me on two scores. But all right, I'll accept that. Minus 32 and snowfall on Monday will be uh, seven inches. Eight point seven. 8.7. Well, I hope you're right. See, I always go to him and give me something I like better. Somehow, <laughs> why? 11. It's going to be snowing at 15 degrees, so it's going to be fluffy. It's going to be like a 20 to 1 ratio. So, I think that's it for now.
And Pete, thanks for driving. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You bet. We're talking some more about you know the nature of these cold outbreaks. It's very interesting. It isn't it isn't so straightforward. It's just it gets cold in Canada and comes south. There's a lot more to it, and I think the community's learned a lot more about it just in the last 20 years. Thanks to Hakeman and Cavallo and others. I think we need more to, to work more on that. Maybe really a, a, an honest dissection of this cold air outbreak would be very interesting and enlightening. Great. And thanks to people that offered questions on this, and maybe we'll have some folks that can speak to these. Uh, Sudden stratospheric warming, yeah, yeah, maybe in a, in a future weather watch. Yeah, that'd be good. I mean, Somebody another can... thing that's interesting about this situation is there is no strong, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the stratosphere of yeah, up there, the polar night jet. Mm -hmm. Polar night jet has been destroyed, yeah, and so it's not there. Is that allowing this more direct interaction with the tropics, which is, I think, what's going on right now? Well, I don't know. I I don't see the tropics in this whole scenario, but I don't see it the way you do. So that's just me. I mean, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to say that's not right. I just don't see it that way. I see everything coming from higher latitude in this well, particular take, instance. Pete, put up the jet streams real quickly from my site. Just the jet streams. If you just look at those and see how a little bit strange it is where you have Just that top one there at 60 degrees. So you see that no, no, equatorial yeah. jet right there that's right in the Pacific? This thing here? It's coming up? Yeah. And yeah, you but, see that it's connected with a subtropical jet from the southern hemisphere. But I don't see how it's connected to our continental North America. That's what I don't get. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, but but there's what there is is there's some kind of a large disturbance moving along the equator just to the south. And this thing is dropping in. Well, I see that. I mean, but... but I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying that since there's something anomalous here, that explains anomalies in other places? Oh, I don't know. I oh, just know. Okay. I just know it's it's a coincidence that these are occurring. It's probably not a coincidence. I, I imagine. And what you don't see up there is you don't see a strong polar night jet. Yeah, so it's a bald so spot. Is this the actual polar? Left. Is this in, in lieu of the polar night jet? This thing is dropping south, mm -hmm. and these know. tropical plumes. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 something different than is normal. That's for sure. I mean, and in, in many in many manifestations, this is just a different um, manifestation. Yeah. And maybe they do get. And an what we've been discussing on the internet is the, is these super rotation jets <laughs> the growing westerlies at the equator have to do with breaking waves and along the subtropical jet. They break in the transfer momentum to the equator. If that's breaking south, what's going on to the north? No, I mean, what's the what's the theoretical connection? Why should there be a one to one or one to two or some sort of relationship thing? What is the connection? I don't know. Well, well, I, well this, this we were we were hypothesized there is some relationship between oh okay. between what's going on at the poles and what's going on down here. There is a relationship, but it's definitely weird to see what you're pointing out. I mean, that's an odd structure. It's in an odd place. There's no question about that. And this is coincident with this really odd minus 40 ish year, right. 50. I mean, I don't know. It's uh, very curious. But that's exactly why we should, I think we really should take this on and just do a, a full diagnostic of this entire event. If it, especially if it turns out to get us near a record, which it looks like it will. I mean, that'd be really interesting. We're bound to learn things that we don't know right now. And the other aspect was the fact that it seemed like that air coming from higher latitudes was actually. Cooling a little bit. <coughs> yeah, kept yeah. on in, in, in episodically. There were periods where it would rise a little and cool, then sink it apparently, and then do the same thing again. And I saw on the trajectories in Biz 5D, you saw a little bit of that upward vertical motion and downward vertical motion. The upward being more intense than the downward. It was, it was really a going up the escalator and then down the stairs, sort of. So when you get such cold air rising, and it's dynamically forced, it just doesn't yeah. naturally rise. Yeah, Something is dynamically lifting that air. Yeah, and it's, uh, but that's not the whole story this time, because that kind of same thing happens. The same large scale setup has occurred a number of times since I've lived here. I've never seen the air stay consistently near minus 40 and make it there, <coughs> make it to us at minus 40. Right, because it usually sinks and spreads. Because something else is missing, yeah. So maybe it's the fact that you have a such a strong vortex, it's right, actually it's stable, and it just, it, it can't spread. Traps it, that's right. So I'm thinking it's the TPV, and if those things are, if they're systematically, well, here's another thing. People argue in the climate community, of course, the jet is moving forward. Might well be the case. If that's true, and your TPVs are being created diabatically in the high latitude, then there's a higher incidence of them getting ingested into mid latitude flow, which may be the thing that makes the mid latitude flow more wavy. Not octave amplification, but instead connection. 
with these things. And so it doesn't matter the atmosphere. If it makes it more wavy, then you have a better chance of bringing these things quickly southward. And especially if the structures are intense, like you said, they're coming coherently. The upper PV and the low-level cold puddle are coming coherently. And they, if they hit you, they hit you like we're well, going to get on. I, I think it seems pretty obvious that this, <laughs> this is the polar vortex that would normally be over the poles. And I think it's split between here and Asia. And there is no polar <coughs> vortex sitting at the poles anymore. Instead, it's moved over us and over Asia. Yeah, I wish we could form. Yeah, see Which is what the, happens with your sun stratospheric warming a lot. Yeah, I've seen it from a polar stereographic map. It's easier to see than the than the continent. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. The, yeah. Because you can then see the separation sometimes. It's very obvious. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you got to go to the north. Yeah, it's a, just a, right. I mean, right there, it's obvious. There's two at the end. It's two completely mm -hmm. separate right. 850 blobs. Of Nothing at the, at the poles, right? Yeah, right. At, at the poles are evacuated right about yeah, now. Right. And as John, you were saying at that time, right there, we're the coldest yeah. anywhere in the heavens. Right, right there. there. Yeah, yeah. There's no place colder at 850 than Dane County. This is <laughs> claiming there's some connection to that and the lack of a polar night jet at very high level. That's more like. In my mind, I, I see that as a, as a very but there good. Is, but what I've also seen that I have to investigate more is there's a connection between the polar night jet and these tropical pollutants. Is that signal the end of the cold air production then in terms of winter? It's probably not going to get any colder than that now. Well, we're getting close to the end anyway. You get to yeah. mid-February, it's hard to, to re, you know, remobilize. So it might be, this could be the whole ball of wax. How's your diagnostic Monday? for the hemispheric cold pollutants? Uh, we are getting back to about average. We're about the 25th warmest year of all time. It's really midland. So it's uh, it went way down and then it's come back up with this thing. But um, I'll bring that next Friday. It'll be near the end of the month. So That's 200 mil of our yes. All right. Well, that's all. I think we, we probably should quit now. But thanks for the good discussion. And thank thanks. you, Michael. And thank you, Pete. And we'll see you all next week. Uh, if we survive. Thanks. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, I guess I gotta get back on two ten, I got class of two twenty five.